Good afternoon, Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture uh, on can banks regain uh, public trust. Uh, as all of you know, as the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, I always make three points uh, in my introduction. Uh, I'll do the same today. First, a word about Dr. Lee Seng Ti, who is endowed this lecture. Uh, second, a word about the topic. And thirdly, a word about our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Philip uh, Hildebrand. Uh, I want to begin, of course, by thanking uh, Dr. Lee Seng Ti for giving us this generous gift. Uh, it was actually originally for 1.4 million Singapore dollars. Uh, we went to see him and we said, Dr. Lee, we have a mission to save the world. And he said, okay, I'll give you the money. <laughs> and as a result of that, we've done several projects, uh, had several workshops, and you will see that we came out with a special issue of a global policy journal uh, on the topic of global energy governance. Uh, later this year, we're coming out with a special book on global health governance, which will also be uh, edited by one of our professors, new professors here, uh, Professor Tiki Pang. So uh, Dr. Lee Seng Ti has been remarkably generous uh, to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and I'm very glad that we could sort of uh, thank him once again uh, publicly today. I'm sorry he's not here with us, uh, Philip, but I did write to him and tell him about the event that we're having uh, today. My second point is about the topic, and frankly, I cannot think of a more uh, topical subject uh, on which anyone can speak other than the subject of uh, can banks regain uh, public trust uh, all over the world. There's a lot of new questioning that is going on uh, on the future of banks and their roles. And I don't know how many of you noticed it, but just last week, uh, on September 13th, four days ago, uh, there was a column in the Financial Times by John Gapper, and the title is The Financial Incentive to Behave Badly Will Endure. And in fact, he asked the questions in the articles, you know, will it be possible for banks to regain the trust. And he actually, he, be, he begins by quost, quoting various people, including Anshu Jain, the Deutsche Bank Joint Chief Executive, who conceded that tremendous mistakes have been made. He quotes Vikram Pandit of Citigroup, who talked of a profound responsibility to keep the financial system safe. And you may all recall that Vikram Pandit was here on stage a few weeks ago, uh, speaking here also about the future of banks. But I want to tell you, by the way, the conclusion of this John Gapper article, and I already warned Philip, our speaker, was that no, it'll be very difficult uh, for banks uh, to regain the public trust because of the financial incentive systems are designed in some ways to create these sorts of problems. But in any case, if there's anybody at all who can address this subject uh, with great authority, it is our speaker today, uh, Dr. Uh, Philip Hildebrand. Currently, he's the Senior Visiting Fellow at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford University, and until recently, the Governor of the Swiss uh, National Bank. He completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto, and then went on to pursue his postgraduate studies at the Graduate Institute of International Studies uh, in Geneva, the Uni European University in Florence, and the Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. He received his PhD in International Relations from Oxford University in 1994. Philip began his career in the World Economic Forum as an associate member of the executive board in 1994. In 1995, he joined Moore Capital Management in London and New York, becoming partner and senior managing director in 1997. In 2000, he moved on to the Von Tobel Group in Zurich before becoming chief investment officer and an executive board member at Union Boncaire Privé in Geneva in 2001. So you see it has very distinguished experience in the private sector. He then began his career in the Swiss National Bank in 2003 at the age of 40, becoming the youngest ever policymaker at the bank. He became governor in January 2010 after holding the position of vice chairman uh, of the governing board. While he was the governor of the Swiss uh, National Bank, Philip also served on the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, 
and was also the uh, vice chairman of the fi Financial Stability Board. So if you want to find someone who knows how the international organizations work in this area, again, there's no one better qualified than Philip to speak in that uh, dimension too. He's also been a member of the Group of 30, a group of the leading financial and economic minds in the world since 2008. And in 2011, he was named Central Bank Governor of the Year by the Banker Magazine. He's also been a visiting professor of economics and political science at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva since 2002. And he'll be joining the asset management firm BlackRock in October, overseeing their operations in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and the Asia Pacific. So truly, we have a globally distinguished individual to address the most important global question of our time. So may I welcome you now, Philip, to the podium. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Mabubani. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, and I'd also like to thank Dr. S.T. Lee for making this uh, lecture possible. I'm delighted and honored to be here at your school this evening. I'm told that this is your eight-year anniversary, or your eight-year anniversary is coming up, and I want to pay tribute, take this opportunity to pay tribute to what you've achieved together with your colleagues. You've built a competitive um, institution here in Singapore that is helping to shape great leaders for a great region at a decisive time in its history. I'm particularly pleased uh, to have the privilege to meet some of your students over the next couple of days in, a, in an intimate setting to discuss with them some of the challenges facing the global economy and the global financial system. Uh, let me also say how pleased I am to be back here in Singapore, again seeing so many old and, and many new friends, uh, coming from another very small country surrounded by a very large economic region. I find myself each time deeply impressed with Singapore's determination and skill, not only to rise to the challenge of being small, but to use a unwavering commitment to openness, excellence, and hard work to maintain and continue to foster prosperity for its citizens and those who make Singapore their home. Dean, you have put the following question to me uh, for this uh, evening's discussion. Can banks regain public trust? Uh, I can give you my short answer. My short answer is yes, they can, and much more importantly, they must. Um, at least in the Atlantic world, there can be no doubt that confidence and trust in banks has been severely damaged, if not shattered. To illustrate this, I like to refer to a former governor colleague of mine who was recently asked, albeit in a private setting, uh, what he thought the public expected of banks, his brief answer, only the worst, captures uh, the extent of the problem. According to recent surveys, the trust of the American people in the financial system has reached a new all-time low, driven uh, by a notable drop in confidence in big banks. The situation is equally bad, if not worse, in Europe, where banks are at the heart of the sovereign debt crisis that has had such a firm and destabilizing grip on the European economy. The lack of confidence is not just a matter of perception. Uh, it is clearly visible in the data. Interbank lending has shrunk drastically, so banks don't even trust each other effectively. Uh, debt holders' demand for collateral remains very high. And price-to-book ratios for banks are extremely low. Now, the challenge of regaining trust and confidence in banks is not a nice to have, it is a critical one. A restoration of confidence, or at the very least, benign indifference, is a necessary condition for a sustained economic recovery. We need to accept, whether we like it or not, that banks are not just private enterprises, in particular the large global banks. In a globalized economy underpinned by global trade and capital flows, their proper functioning constitutes one of the keystones of economic prosperity. 
if vast sections of the population don't have confidence in banks, the credit channel will be impaired and economic growth and prosperity will be undermined. In other words, confidence in banks is a key element of a prosperous global economy. Now, with a focus on the US and on Europe, we need to ask ourselves, how did we end up in what appears to be a uniquely bad situation? After all, you could argue, uh, and some of you will know this, every financial crisis gives rise to its fair share of bank bashers. Indeed, money changers, if you think about it historically, money changers have been vilified throughout history. Yet, something is different about this crisis. After what uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke has once called the great moderation, we now seem to be stuck in what could be labeled the great frustration with the world's largest banks at the heart of it all. In a wonderful recent lecture, the former Reserve Bank of India, Governor Reddy, has examined plausible reasons for the profound erosion of trust in banks in some jurisdictions. He refers to the severe impact of the financial crisis on large sections of the world's population, highly questionable behavior, by major global banks, lack of transparency, excessive compensation, shortage of credit despite government bailouts, and persistent opposition by industry leaders to suggestions of strengthening regulation. I largely agree with Dr. Reddy's analysis. Yet, it seems to me, beneath these reasons, there is something deeper, something more systemic or systematic, that helps explain the extent of societal frustrations. For one thing, the magnitude of this crisis was unprecedented in modern times. Consider only the following figure. The financial crisis is estimated to have triggered losses of nearly $2.5 trillion. But the vast magnitude of, the, of these losses is only a consequence of something deeper yet. I believe at the heart of the problem lies the recognition that the international banking paradigm was systematically flawed. What do I mean by that? A close examination of the data reveals that to a large extent, the focus of the industry was on high rates of return of equity, driven above all by ever greater degrees of leverage. Such a model fostered excessive compensation and, by consequence, excessive behavior built on leverage-induced short-term profits. The incentives were, by definition, non-sustainable. Risks were borne asymmetrically. The upside went largely to a relatively small group of employees, the downside to the shareholders and, ultimately, the taxpayers. To make matters worse, this international banking paradigm appears to have been remarkably resilient in the post-crisis era so far. For a frust frustratingly long time, one could not help but observe the extent to which the industry failed to recognize the need for a shift in paradigm. Personally, I was disheartened again and again to see many of the world's leading bankers publicly lament the fact that the new regulatory environment will compress the rate of return on equity, as if this was unequivocally a bad thing. Typically, there would be no mention of the fact that when examined through a risk-adjusted lens, a lower rate of return on equity does not have to be a negative outcome. In fact, current price-to-book valuations of most large international banks demonstrate compellingly that from a shareholder's perspective, there was nothing particularly attractive about the previous high rates of return on equity. Might it be that the general public has understood more than many leading bankers? I firmly believe that trust cannot be restored until senior management truly embrace the logic of risk-adjusted returns Embracing such a perspective will mean refocusing the business towards activities where profitability 
is not above all a function of leverage. This brings me to the regulatory response to the crisis. The principal objective of the Basel III Accords under the auspices of the Financial Stability Board agreed almost exactly to the day two years ago in Basel is to strengthen the resilience of the international banking system. At its core are the new capital accords which aim to reduce leverage as a source of high returns on equity. I remain deeply convinced, even after now having left office uh, eight months ago, or more, nine months ago, that regulatory change is essential as a lever that will alter the incentives for management and ultimately its behavior. Fortunately, it is not the only lever uh, exerting pressure. Investors have concluded themselves that they want to see much higher capital cushions. In other words, investors have realized that the previous paradigm has not worked for them. This recognition will push management teams towards a risk-adjusted base business model and away from activities that are solely or largely profitable by way of the deployment of massive leverage. The reason for this is simple. The previous model has badly failed the longer-term interests of shareholders. And indeed, management is beginning to react. Certainly in rhetoric, you've mentioned some of the quotes a minute ago, and increasingly in actual strategy. Change seems to be apparent. We can see times have changed and we need to change and change rapidly. Or smaller, simpler, safer, and stronger. These are statements made only last week by two of the world's leading CEOs in reference to their strategy and their bank's business models. Now, is Basel III perfect? Of course not. Given that Basel III is an international accord which was difficult to reach, requiring concessions and compromises, it cannot be perfect. My personal shortlist of shortcomings would be insufficient determination and clarity with regard to a complementary but crucial leverage ratio, the ongoing heavy reliance on banks' own risk models to calculate their risk-weighted assets, and continued lack of progress on developing an operational framework to enable orderly cross-border resolution for largest international banks. There are certainly other shortcomings. But does this mean we should depart from the Basel III framework? In my opinion, that would be a grave mistake. It would send a terrible signal to the banks who are finally beginning to respond to the intended capital incentives, albeit in many cases reluctantly and arguably late. Any weakening of the regulatory resolve would only strengthen the too little, too late mode many banks have been operated under for too long. So where do we go from here and what can concretely be done by banks and the regulatory community to address a persistent and profound confidence problem? As I already implied, the commitment to the FSB and the Basel framework by bankers regulators, and politicians strikes me as a crucial first step. Unfortunately, there is already considerable divergence at the level of translating the Basel III Accords into national law. This is not all bad, for the Basel Accords were conceived from the beginning as minimum standards, a fact that is often overlooked. However, material divergence, substantive divergence, will undermine the crucial objective of establishing a level playing field for global banks in the longer term. But it also indirectly weakens the commitment to the Basel III framework and thus undermines the restoration of confidence. Second, the political leaders of the major jurisdictions from which international banks operate need to make a much deeper commitment to removing many of the obstacles, particularly in the area of bankruptcy law, 
that continue to undermine the possibility of building a workable cross-border resolution framework for the largest international banks. Basel III aims to increase the resilience of the financial system. It cannot and should not aim to eliminate the possibility of a major crisis occurring at some point in the future. When that crisis hits, and it will, greater resilience might not be enough. We must then be in a position to have a workable resolution mechanism for global banks so as to avoid having to resort yet again to taxpayers' money. To put it simply, we need a special cross-border bankruptcy code for large international banks. Third, transparency needs to be augmented. This is particularly true in the area of financial infrastructure. The notorious opacity of the derivatives market was a major source of vulnerability during the crisis and undermined confidence a great deal. The same is true for disclosure practices of financial institutions. The good news is the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee, and national regulators continue to work on all these fronts. The bad news is I worry that the political, at the political level, the interest for these important but technical and difficult issues uh, is waning. Fourth, and this is both crucial and terribly difficult and intangible, a change in culture is desperately needed if confidence in the public, or the confidence of the public in large global banks is to be restored. The difficult subject of compensation is closely linked to culture. I argued at the outset that the largest global banks are more than just private enterprises. If you accept that premise, you must demand of the leaders of these banks to be more than just CEOs or business leaders. They must be agents and catalysts of a transformational change in culture. They must pursue their own legitimate profit motives in alignment with the interests of their clients and their shareholders. Ultimately, they must come to see themselves not just as senior executives running a profitable business. They must also see themselves as stewards of a resilient and stable financial system, which, as has become so painfully apparent, is a prerequisite to growth and prosperity. As we all know, cultural change is hard. I was therefore pleased to see that only last week here on this stage, or two weeks ago, Vikram Pandit, the CEO of Citigroup, addressed your school and committed himself and his bank to the following three criteria to be applied rigorously before his bank will conduct any business. First, is it in my client's interest? Second, does it have economic value? And third, is it systemically responsible? These almost Rotarian questions are undoubtedly the right ones to ask. Properly lived by, they will lead to profound changes in the business models of the world's largest banks. In the end, the more I reflect on this topic, the more I keep coming back to the core of the Basel III Accords. I continue to believe that we should resist the temptation to resort to micro-regulation to force about a particular business model, let alone a cultural transformation. Capital will remain the key lever that will ensure a profound transformation of the business model, which will allow for a deep cultural change to take hold over time. Only if such a transformation occurs can confidence and trust be truly restored. Therefore, it is my belief that not only should banks firmly pursue the buildup of capital cushions demanded by the Basel III framework and increasingly and importantly by investors, particularly in Europe where capital cushions are on the whole inferior to those in the United States, I believe it would be wise to accelerate the buildup of capital and bring up the long-dated deadlines of uh, the Basel III timeline. Where necessary, regulators and governments could take appropriate actions to ensure such an outcome. In this context, 
It is important to note that the proposition, or often the conventional idea, that more robust capital cushions constrain lending is in fact neither borne out by the facts nor indeed by the theory. The resulting new business model will emphasize traditional banking businesses such as retail banking, wealth management, and private banking, custody services, as well as traditional corporate and mortgage lending. Investment banking will not disappear, nor should it. Transactional services will be a key component, particularly for those banks built around a core business of wealth management. Advice for mergers and acquisitions and other corporate transactions will also feature prominently. Trading activities, largely built around leverage, on the other hand, will be and should be severely penalized. Banks will produce much lower rates of return on equity, and they are beginning to say so themselves. But what is crucial, and often left unsaid, is that, that this is not an adverse development. Not for the shareholder, and certainly not for the taxpayer. The truth is that unless you assume that a shareholder displayed remarkable skill in timing the market, he or she will not have benefited from the high leverage based business model driven by a non risk adjusted focus on rates of return on equity, which has been so prevalent uh, in the pre crisis years. Indeed, looking at the data, what is striking is that it is not clear that anyone benefited from that model apart from a presumably relatively small number of senior managers by way of extreme levels of compensation. Let me conclude with a brief look at what all this might mean for banks in Singapore. When I look at the publicly available figures for your three largest banks, DBS, OCBS, and UOB, over the last 10 years or so, what is clear is that your banks have largely preserved their business model since the Asian crisis. For instance, in all three banks, income from trading and investment as a percentage of total income continues to be relatively low, somewhere between 8 and 10 percent, maybe 12, and more importantly, has not materially changed since the early 2000s. Over the same period, your banks have, of course, grown substantially in balance sheet and in number of employees. They have also begun increasingly to diversify their businesses across a fast-growing Asian region. This is particularly true for DBS. What is also notable is that on the whole, your banks are largely relying on their deposit base and not the wholesale market for their funding needs. So my admittedly very superficial read of the figures is that since the Asian crisis, Singapore's banks have enjoyed high rates of growth but have largely stuck to their business model. In other words, they do not appear to have fallen for the temptation of copying the business model of their global peer group. Now, you are much better placed than me to ask why that might be. Is it due to a rigorous and disciplined supervisory framework? Or does it have to do with the far-sighted wisdom of those of you running the banks? Is it linked to the fact that these three banks are either privately owned or government owned? Or is it related to the state in the evolution of capital markets in Asia and in particular um, securitization? What if the credit boom, what if the credit boom in the US had lasted another five years before its demise? Would your banks have resisted the temptation to migrate their business model in such a scenario? Clearly, I am not qualified to answer these questions. But I would like to leave them with you to close for reflection. It seems to me the data shows that the large Singaporean banks have navigated the greatest global financial crisis since the Great Depression successfully, not least 
because they broadly stuck to their knitting, as one of my Singaporean friends put it. Hopefully, this manifests itself locally in a higher degree of confidence and trust of the public in your banks than is currently the case in the Atlantic world. There, a lot of hard work lies yet ahead to regain that trust. Dean, thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Philip, for that comprehensive presentation. I'm glad you ended with the good news yeah. that Singapore banks are safe. <laughs> they don't have to pull their money out. But you know, in discussing the reasons at the end as to why uh, Singapore banks are in a somewhat better position, one reason could be that in Singapore, it's been a fact of life that the regulator has always been more powerful than the banks. There's never been a question of any danger of regulatory capture. And when I look especially at the United States, at the way the regulatory institutions work and how the banks can lobby the Congress man and congresswoman who then lobbies and gets their point of view into the regulator. So in that sense, the regulator, in a sense, feel, gets hamstrung from doing the right thing because of political pressures like that. How do you see that factor playing in the future in, in terms of uh, banks regaining public trust? Because if, they believe, if, if the public believes that the banks can still manage the regulators for their own interests, how does that factor in terms of re regaining public trust? I think it's a very good question. And, and what I can tell you is, in the early stages of the Basel III negotiations, um, one of the classic arguments, which I always felt was very disturbing, but was used very broadly uh, against stringent capital requirements, was really that, well, all you really need is good supervision. Um, ironically, or tragically, paradoxically, that argument was forwarded very aggressively by a number of countries who now find themselves in great, great difficulty uh, in terms of their banking system. So uh, that argument never struck me as a compelling one. Now, that would go against the point that it has to do with supervision. Uh, my sense is that particularly if you look at these complex, highly leveraged business models, supervision is incredibly difficult. So when I say I don't have great faith in that argument, it's not because I feel that supervisors are incompetent. It's because by nature, um, the act of supervising a major global cross-border international bank mm is incredibly difficult. The odds that you get it right on time, uh, I think, must be relatively low, no matter how good your supervisors are, no matter mm. how committed you are. Now, it is certainly true to come back to Singapore, and I've mm. had the pleasure of coming here many years, that your supervisors are exceptional, and moreover, that there's a culture here that allows them to be, as you say, tough. Mm. But I think, one has to put that in the context of what I said about the evolution of the business model. The fact that, in many ways, the business models of your banks, and the only ones I know are the biggest ones, have remained relatively simple. And so one has to look at these two things, I think, you know, hand in hand. Uh, can you do good supervision? Yes, I think you can. I think it's very difficult. It's possible. If you evolve in terms of the business model into a highly complex model, the way the largest international banks have, I think it becomes incredibly challenging to be on top of things at the supervisory level, which is why, in my mind, you know, it doesn't, good supervision does not replace, should not and must not replace uh, very robust uh, capital buffers. I would add one point uh, in terms of the if you like, the simplicity, the robustness of the model. And, and I think it seems to me, again, as, a, as an outside observer, you know, privately owned banks, when the owners are actually there with their own risk at stake, with their own wealth at stake, uh, tend to, of course, be watched by the owners, if you like, much more carefully uh, 
um, than large listed stocks, which are very, or companies with a very diversified uh, investor base. And by the way, if you look at the largest international banks nowadays, the average holding period of an investor, the average holding period of stocks, is actually very low. Um, so even though technically shareholders are owners, in reality, if you think of owners as owners that are owners for a long time, many shareholders are not really owners by that definition. And so it makes it harder to monitor what goes on within the bank. Uh, it makes it harder when you don't have owners uh, that are present. One, one of the striking things about the crisis, if you think about it, is you know, we had failures in the non-banking world, uh, some quite dramatic ones. But in the world of finance where partnerships are still uh, the, the, the sort of dominant model, while there have been some failures, none of them have led to any kind of systemic problem. And I think that has to do with the notion of partnership, that your own internal supervision tends to be much more rigorous uh, when your own wealth is at stake as a partner or mm -hmm. as an owner. So I suspect that element has to, has to be kind of played in as well when you look at the Singaporean banks. Yeah. Two of them, of course, two of the three ones are basically privately owned. Mm. Yeah, and they have a very strong private interest in yes. keeping it going. Yeah. You know, by the way, in Paul Volcker's book here, one of the provocative comments he made was that you know, somebody asked him about uh, bankers and the new innovations. And he said something which really angered the banks. He said, the only thing that I know, the only innovation that modern banks have produced is the ATM. Now, I wonder whether you agree, Paul Volcker. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's always tempting to always agree with Paul Volcker. Um, it's a sort of an easy principle to follow. Um, I think that's overstated, to be honest. I do think there have been some uh, you know, securitization. Take securitization. In principle, is a worthwhile innovation that can foster growth and prosperity. Hmm. You take it to the absurd where you repackage things that are worth nothing to then make them AAA bonds, mm. clearly that's not a useful innovation. But I think to say that, that there have what, been no innovations in, is, yeah. is exaggerated. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the floor is, is open for questions. Please, do you don't mind, just come to the microphone, please. Thank you for your talk, your very forthright talk. Enough material there for a fortnight conference, I think. But can I ask you a difficult question? The uh, trust that people have is not just about banks. It's about money. We're all losing our trust in money. Now, I understand the need for some quantitative easing, but is it not getting out of hand? Are we not going to find ourselves in dire inflation quite soon? I, I don't think so. I think, uh, you know, I can understand why people worry about this, particularly if, you, if your culture is, let's say, the Germanic culture, where the defining kind of experience, the defining memory of economic history is hyperinflation. Uh, I think it is understandable that if you come from that world, and I do as a Swiss, uh, to some extent at least, that is a worry that you know, people have. On the other hand, I must say I continue to have confidence in uh, the central bankers who are at work today uh, remaining deeply committed to price stability and moreover having the tools and the instruments to absorb the liquidity when that becomes necessary. The, the, the problem we have in a way is on the one hand people, as you su suggest, may feel that money is no longer what it once was because they see essentially a debt crisis being fought with more debt. That's what it comes down to. On the other hand, if you look at polls, if you look at public opinions, you also realize that the same people are very reluctant to accept that a deep and profound adjustment process has to take place to get us out of this crisis. Uh, in other words, that, you know, Income has to be realigned with, with debt. Um, and that's a difficult process. Reforms are very hard to implement. We see it in, in southern Europe right now. There's a limit to what populations are willing to accept. So there's sort of these two 
these two emotions in populations. One is the fear of inflation, that too much is being done to kind of bail people out, too much liquidity is being provided, too much debt is used to fight a debt crisis. And at the same time, the same people are basically unwilling to do the hard adjustment that would be necessary uh, to get out of this you know, without these interventions by governments and central banks. So what, I think we're what, kind of caught in, in, in between. What, what kind of hard adjustments are you thinking, talking about? Give me some examples. Well, I think you have, you have two problems, basically, in, in Europe, uh, but, but really at least one also in the United States. And, and the first one, the dominant one, is the fiscal one. We know we have too much debt. We know. I mean, look, look at the debate in the US. Everybody agrees it's unsustainable. But when it comes down to, well, what do you actually cut down in terms of government spending, you have huge debates that basically frees up the political system. Remember that the part of a budget in most developed economies that is really discretionary, where from year to year you can change spending, is very small. Uh, in the US, I think it's about 20, 30% of the budget is discretionary. The rest is basically entitlements. So if you really want to reduce spending, uh, and reduce debt and deficits, you need to go into the part of the budget that is not discretionary, which are the hard things such as social security, health care, and so forth. And these, uh, the willingness of, of our democracies to make the hard adjustments there is not, is not great either. So that's, I think, where we are in, in a very difficult uh, space that people are worried that the, the response to the crisis will lead to a sort of, as you say, to a loss of trust, not just in banks, but perhaps even in money. At the same time, the same people are not really willing to, to make the hard adjustments that are necessary to, to reach a better equilibrium. So, uh, you know, that is one of the problems we face in, in democracies right now. I think in the end, uh, today central bankers continue to be committed to price stability and uh, will appropriately react when the time comes. I don't think that time is now. Please, go ahead. Identify yourself. Please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I am Diego Mejia, um, currently doctoral student uh, at the NUS Faculty of Law. I, I only have one, one question. Uh, you pointed out that uh, when it comes to the implementation of uh, the Basel Committee recommendations, there are or might be problems in terms of uh, consistency. So my question is, do you think it is desirable and feasible to adopt the recommendations through, say, multilateral treaties or another instrument that is binding? Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's a very good point. So it's important to remember that, as you just said, the Basel Accords are not a treaty, and they're certainly not law that's binding at the national level. Uh, they're basically an accord. They then get turned into law by having the national legislative process be engaged and produce rules or laws depending on, on, on the country. So uh, unless you have that implementation, there is really not very much that's binding there. And, and that's where the problem comes. And I'll give you one example. So the Swiss legislation, which implements Basel III, is probably let's say 20 pages, maybe 30. Um, the US legislation that does many other things, but that also implements Basel III, runs several thousand pages. So you have great divergence, of course, at the national level. And that's OK as long as we're talking divergence in terms of the actual level of capital, for instance, or liquidity. Because as I said in, the, in, in, my, in my lecture, the Basel standards were conceived as minimum standards, where it gets more complicated if the national legislation departs in substance from one country to another and creates uh, distortions in, in terms of competitiveness, distortions in terms of financial stability, and so forth. I don't think we have many other ways at the moment to implement uh, Basel III than through national legislation. So uh, it's, a, it's a very you know, creative idea uh, to do this through a multilateral treaty. But I think we're far away from that. So at the moment, the only option we have is market pressure and peer pressure, hopefully avoiding a, an excessive 
divergence at the national implementation level. Uh, and I think market pressure helps. You know, the market wants to see certain things. And, and so the pressure from the markets can actually be a helpful force here to avoid excessive substantive divergence on implementation. But some of the developments, I agree, are, are worrying on that front. Please, go ahead. Uh, my name is Henry Chen. I'm a uh, doctoral student at uh, SMU. I have uh, three questions for the speaker. The first one is that in Basel II and Basel III, you accept the bank's in-house models. Now, uh, in this eight years uh, trial of uh, UBS in London and the JP Morgan uh, situations, it seems that these in-house models has quite a bit of deficiency in the sense that they are quite late in detecting risks. Now, last week, the Deutsche Bank is, is, is suggesting sharing development of softwares among major banks. How is your take on this? Uh, the second question I have is that on the size of the uh, non-banking financial sectors. Now, in last time, uh, the speaker of the Citibank, he already mentioned about the growing size of these non-bank financial sectors in the banking system. And we know that, that, that this year in Singapore, we have an explosion of bond issuance. And in China now, they have a problem regulating these non-bank financial sectors. Now, uh, if the, uh, the Basel III is just regulating the banks and put in more and more regulations, but we forget to regulate the non-bank financial sectors, are we going to have a dramatic increase of credit risk in these sectors? And the third and lastly is your mention about the problem of this uh, government debt to GDP ratio. Because most of the government now is the biggest borrower in any financial systems. Now, if we are going to have this problem going on, now, how, where down the road is going to affect your inflation fighting ability of the central bankers of the world? Thank you very much. Three, three big questions. Well, on your second question on the non-bank uh, sector, if I'm not mistaken, Vikram Pandit was referring to hedge funds implicitly, saying that you know, if you keep on controlling the banks and you don't regulate the hedge funds, that creates an imbalance. I mean, that's my understanding of the Vikram Pandit's point, if I'm not yes. mistaken. Yes. Actually, in Singapore, we see the explosion of uh, bond issuance. Yeah. Now, in China, now you have these wealth management products. So similarly, they are outside the bank or banking regulators. Yeah. So we have seen this situation now. Because of these low interest rate scenarios, so you have seen the explosion of these products in most uh, jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean, sir. Thank you. Three, three very hard and good mm -hmm. questions. So the first one, it I, is true. You don't get easy questions. So. No, I, <laughs> I can see this is a good school. Um, mm -hmm. On the first one, and I mentioned it in my talk, it is true. And personally, you know, I look at this with some regret that we collectively could not find the strength or the resolve or the inspiration or the courage, whatever you want to call it, to spend a bit more time on thinking through this very fundamental point that essentially we leave uh, the risk modeling to the banks. Okay, this was a, uh, Kishore told me before we came in here that I can now speak freely. I'm still slightly <laughs> uh, you know, I guess once a central banker, you're always yeah. one, and so it's hard to speak completely freely. But I would say, to put it diplomatically, it's, it's the sort of, it's a big topic that we didn't tackle. Um, now, I'm not sure there are any easy answers for it. You know, the alternative at this stage would be the way I see it, too. One is that somehow the authorities would have to decide how to model this stuff. That doesn't necessarily give me a great deal of comfort, to be honest. I'm not sure we would be much better at this than the banks have been. The second alternative would be to go back to Basel I, uh, where effectively the authorities designed 10 risk buckets, let's say, 10 different types of asset classes. And every asset on the balance sheet of every bank has to go into one of these buckets. And each of the bucket uh, is, has some kind of weight on it, which is a, essentially another form of modeling, but a much more uh, simple one. There are some people who argued, or there were some people in the Basel III negotiations, not so much in the negotiations, but around, who suggest that we should go back to a, to a bucket model uh, the way it was in, in Basel I. Um, so the question, you know, risk weighting makes sense. 
You, a bond you, you is not the same. You have to explain to everybody thing. what the bucket model is. Yeah, it's just a, it's another way of modeling. You say, okay, we're going to determine that every asset that you own as a bank has to go into one of seven or ten or eight buckets, and each bucket has a different weight in terms of how much capital you have to hold against it. So take the simple example until. A few years ago, we would have said government bonds are always safe, so they don't require any capital. Mm -hmm. Now that's not so clear anymore. Especially um, the Greek bonds. Exactly. So, so you can see, and yet modeling makes, or risk weighting makes sense, because it is true that a government bond is not the same thing as some complex yeah. uh, securitized uh, you know, piece of paper with all kinds of layers in it and so forth. So we need to have, a leverage ratio alone would not work doesn't make sense. You need to have some kind of modeling. The question is how to do it. The point I'm trying to make, and, and the question was not really addressed. So it was sort of the elephant in the room that was just left, left in the middle of the room. I'm not sure we would have come up with a workable, sensible answer, but it is, it is a problem. And perhaps the type of uh, proposal to make it more transparent not just vis-a-vis not just vis -vis other banks, but also to the regulators, how these risk models work, that might be a first step. The truth is, and I can tell you from having been on the official side, uh, in many cases, you had no idea how these models worked. Mm. Okay. All you knew is, or all we knew, that's ex post. A, that's, a, that's a strong confession well, uh, to make. Well, you know, <laughs> listen, I think many of the CEOs nowadays, if you listen to Chuck Prince or others who have left, they will say publicly, uh, that they had way too much faith in models they really didn't understand. Um, so that's a, I think that is a very valid issue, and uh, we'll have to see how to move forward. In my view, you know, again, the answer comes back to capital. Given that that's the case, given that we don't really know how to resolve that problem right now, all the more reason to have very high and very robust capital buffers. Um, on your second point, uh, I watched Vikram's speech here, <clears throat> and he made a very forceful mm. uh, point on this. Uh, now, you should know that the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, is very much looking into the shadow banking system. So this is the next stage in terms of the regulatory reform. So the problem is being recognized. My own sense is that, again, as long as we have predominantly partnership or partnership type of models in that world, I'm not so concerned about it, uh, not as concerned as other people might be, because I think the ownership structure in the shadow banking system, until now at least, has led to a much greater degree of internal discipline by the owners in terms of avoiding excessive risk taking. If we see the shadow banking system evolving in two ways, where the ownership structure changes, and where suddenly they start to issue debt themselves, uh, which is one of the points you, you raised, you know, that may become a slightly different issue. Remember that traditionally the shadow banking system, if it was leveraged, it received its leverage largely from the banks. So you can make the argument, as long as we're in that world, and as long as we regulate the banks properly, the, the risk that something goes seriously wrong in terms of excessive leverage should, re leverage should be limited. If we move into a world where they can themselves uh, leverage up without resorting to the banks <clears throat> by, for instance, issuing debt, uh, the issue becomes a slightly different one. So I would watch, personally, what I watch in the shadow banking world is the ownership structure and the ability of those firms to leverage themselves independently of the banking system. Um, and your third point on the debt to GDP ratio, um, as I said earlier, I do believe central banks continue to have the right instruments to uh, absorb liquidity when the time comes. I don't think that time is now. Uh, and so, no, I'm not, I'm not worried per se uh, that some of the interventions by central banks will lead to inflation. What I worry about is that in the end, we must recognize that central banks cannot solve, they cannot generate jobs, they can't generate growth, they can't, you know, implement structural reform. In a crisis, they can buy time. So I think the real problem here is the time that is being bought by the central banks 
needs to be used by the politicians to do the hard adjustment, whether mm -hmm. it's on competitiveness, whether it's on the fiscal side. These are things that the central bank cannot solve. And uh, you know, these are responsibilities <coughs> that lie with the political systems. So that means the obvious follow-up question. The central banks are buying the time. Are the policymakers making, making use of time to make the hard structural adjustments? Well, take the European case. So what the ECB has done, uh, I think, appropriately, it has said, we will buy time, but only, only if the reforms continue by way of, in this particular case, by way of a program uh, through the ESM or potentially in combination with the IMF. Mm. Uh, so this is exactly the attempt by Mario Draghi and his colleagues to avoid a situation where suddenly the central bank, you know, is looked to not just to buy time, but to actually solve the problem. Mm. What he's saying is we can take out the extreme risk, we can buy you time, but we're only going to do that if you, on the political side, continue with the necessary reforms Hmm. Uh, to kind of return to some equilibrium down the road. Okay, Zegen, introduce yourself to. Sure, I'm an associate professor here at the, at the school, and um, my main research and, and teaching interest uh, is ethics, and um, maybe maybe more of a fundamental question. But we're talking a lot about um, rules, regulations, regulatory systems, uh, legal issues, which are of course very important, but perhaps more fundamentally. Uh, I think it's also uh, a lot of the things that went wrong uh, have to do with, with individual and also organizational ethics, organizational culture. And um, a few days after the, the crisis commenced in 2008, there was a great piece in the, in the New York Times, and it was kind of a call for more um, ethics courses, ethics lectures in, in the MBA curricula, in the curricula of many business uh, schools. Um, I don't think much has changed since then. Uh, we're at the public policy school. We pay some attention to ethics in our in our courses. Do you think it would be a good idea to have a, a mandatory lecture um, module course, uh, at least discussion and reflection on ethical issues and ethical awareness uh, in some of the big um, education programs that? Uh, educate future business managers uh, in terms of also prevention, perhaps? You know, it, it seems to me that's a bit like asking whether motherhood is a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, of course, I think that's a good thing. And, and most, of probably everyone in this room would agree. Um, and hopefully one of the things, one of the consequences of the crisis is that schools will begin to do that more rigorously, including business schools. And, so forth. Uh, on the other hand, what I would say is that it actually does come down, in my mind, to, to some very simple things. Uh, and again, to the two themes that I really tried to emphasize today, capital and the business model. Why? If you have a business model, by the way, and one thing I should have mentioned, I didn't in my lecture, because I, to me it's self-evident, but a lot of this happened as a result of flawed regulation. In 1996, uh, an amendment was introduced to Basel I, which effectively eliminated the need to hold capital against trading positions. And in many ways, you can trace back and see that that's the beginning of this terrible trend that led to, to this excessive, yeah, to yeah. The excessive leverage. And uh, so you know, in, in some ways, you can argue what, what's happening here is we're kind of trying to go back to a world similar to what it was in 96. But the point I was going to make is, if you have incentives that lead to a business model that is based on extreme, extreme leverage, and remember, some of these banks were leveraged, in the end, in, in late 2007, some of these banks, or early 2008, had as little as less than 2% capital relative to total assets. Uh, so we're talking about you know, massive leverage. If you have a business model that essentially drives off an extreme form, an extreme degree of leverage, to me it is not surprising that extreme behavior starts to become the norm. Extreme compensation starts to become the norm. Extreme aggressiveness starts to become the norm. 
and ultimately you know, undermines ethical standards that perhaps individually in the employees of these banks are actually quite well anchored. But if you have, if you have a model that relies on extremity, I think over time it is not surprising that human behavior starts to become extreme too. So while you can never, we all know fraud will always be part of the human condition and you will always have cases of fraud and the UBS case that you referred to, uh, you know, I would say is a classic case of fraud. I'm not sure you can avoid that. However, uh, having a model that per se relies on extreme forms, extreme degrees of leverage will likely in my mind, trigger extreme behavior in other areas, which will then foster an environment uh, where unethical behavior becomes more likely. And that is why where I would say, yes, definitely do that, have courses, but in the end, the main driver, I think, should be uh, the inability, ultimately, or the very high cost of going back to that kind of extreme business model imposed by uh, capital requirements, and increasingly by, by markets. Shareholders have understood this has not worked well for them. I mean, go back, look at any chart of uh, stock price, and go back and see how long you have to go back to get to the same level where you are today. So most shareholders, if you assume that they've stayed in, they have lost a, tr a tremendous amount of money. So, And, and investors are beginning to realize that that the model really hasn't worked very well. And that's why, you know, that plus the, the incentives from regulation is why we're beginning to see uh, promising signs, such as we saw in, in the lecture last week, of, of change in terms of the cultural, uh, the, the business model and, and, and ultimately the culture. You have a question? My name is Gabriel Burgener. I'm from the Zankalen Institute here. And, um, this might be maybe a little bit a layman's question. A little but bit a, what? A layman's question layman's out of great. box. But uh, my question is, how big do the banks really need to be? Um, how big do they need to be to have a fi global financial industry running efficiently? And just to explain where, is, um, where, my, where this idea, this question is coming from, it's, it's actually very much related to your, um, to your I to your stress on partnerships, on the ownership structure of banks, and uh, incorp incorporation, you know, the, 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 the legal form of a, of, a co of a corporation. What I was taught through textbooks back in my studies is uh, the corporation, that's just a jurisdictional person, you know, it's not a human being with, with soul or ethics. Don't blame it. Don't, pl don't dislike the, the, the player but more the system, and as such, um, if you have an, inco an incorporated entity, such an institution, there's always the risk of discretionary power, nobody taking the responsibility as, as a substitution model, which is basically what the whole leverage um, problem leads to. If we want to break this down, if we want to have banks like in Singapore, where many are still private, privately owned, or owned by the government, they cannot be too big, because at one point you probably need to incorporate, right? So the question is, could we actually live in a world where all the banks are owned privately, partnerships? Could we have a network? Would there be any such organizational setup? Setup is just tweaking at the capital, at the capital um, re regulations. That's my question. It's well, yeah. So look, first of all, we're not, we're not about. This is not about tweaking the capital regulations. To give you some order of magnitude, banks will probably have to hold, if you take into account the level and the definition of capital, somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight and maybe more times capital than they had before the crisis. So it's, it's really not tweaking. It, it's pretty substantial what's happening. The question is very valid. I'm very fond of partnerships, as you could tell in my comments, and I think they work very well in terms of risk management, much better than any other form, for very simple reasons. If your entire net worth or a very high percentage of your net worth is in your company, you're going to pay attention. Even if you're on vacation, you call in every day and you pay attention. Yeah. That's just a human condition. Can that model be kind of applied across the board in a globalized economy? I don't think so. Um, and in fact, it'll be interesting to see you know, as Asian capital markets evolve, 
And as Asia becomes a much bigger region in terms of finance, uh, whether it will be possible or desirable for the two banks that I referred to to continue to be privately owned. This will be a very interesting test case. You can see why it works at the moment because, as, as I mentioned, many of the, the development of the capital markets in Asia is not yet as far advanced. Now, whether that was a good thing is another question, but you know, I think many good things have come out of innovation, again, in the US and, and in Europe. We shouldn't forget that. We shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So um, whether that will be possible, we'll see. There's another reason why I'm skeptical to impose size limits. And by the way, it was one of the things we did discuss at the time as one possible regulatory answer to the problems we had in Switzerland. I, for one, felt strongly that, you know, how would we then come up with the right size? Uh, so when it comes to the ability of governments or the public sector to do things, I think you have to stay humble. You have to recognize that in the end, you know, it is a tough assumption to say that governments are going to be much smarter than the collective kind of wisdom of, of financial markets. And so we took a very in a way, it's a very liberal approach to the problem by saying, we don't know what the right size is, so how can we then impose a size if we don't know what the appropriate size limit is? And therefore, we're going to work through the capital structure and the incentives. Now, you could argue we just demanded everybody as a partnership again. I suspect that would not be growth enhancing in today's world uh, of open, uh, globalized you know, capital markets and trade flows we would probably find that if we only had private banks, privately owned banks in the, in the whole world, uh, that, would, that would not be growth enhancing uh, and might undermine uh, you know, prosperity. But, but it's an argument that many people make. Thank you. Okay, the last question to a lady. Um, hello, my name is Bindi Desai and I'm doing my MBA in SPGen in Consulting Management. My question is when we talk about public trust, I think the financial crisis uh, brought out the undergoing operations in banks, which actually broke public trust. And you also spoke about lack of transparency. What are the key measures that we are going to take in future to bring out the transparency on the customer side? Because all the regulations that are coming up, they're more so on the way banks are working. But we are still not understanding how they are working in, what are they doing uh, underneath uh, their operations. And do you think social media or something like that could be integrated to bring the transparency more, or any other major measures? Uh, I think an important one is much more transparency by way of standardization when it comes to products, in particular complex derivatives products. And this is one of the important um, regulatory initiatives uh, to reduce, you know, to a great extent products that can be traded over the counter where you don't really know um, the pricing, you don't understand the details of the product. So I think to the extent that we can standardize um, a lot of the derivatives market, that will increase transparency. It may come at the cost of some innovation. Uh, so it's a trade-off. In a way, if you, th you know, think about it, if you and I want to make a financial transaction that doesn't interest anybody else in this room, but only meets your needs and my needs, then it is very hard to do that if we live in a world where only standardized products are allowed. Because by definition, if we've come up with a product that only meets your needs and my needs, there's going to be nobody else in this room who wants the same product, and therefore uh, it probably would be very difficult to standardize it. So I think there are some cases where over-the-counter, tailor-made products so that you and I can enter into a very specific financial transaction can make sense. Um, and I don't think we would want to eliminate that altogether. On the other hand, what we saw in the run-up to the crisis was just a vast explosion of over-the-counter uh, transactions uh, that lacked transparency by definition because none of it was standardized. In many cases, as you know, those of you who follow this, in many cases, the paperwork was late. It wasn't properly documented. Uh, you know, the property rights were not clearly established, all kinds of things like that as a result of too much 
uh, tailor-made uh, product innovation. So in the end, I think it's a trade-off. Clearly, the trend is going towards much greater standardization, which will increase transparency for the end user. Um, it may come at some cost in terms of innovation because it'll make it more expensive for you and I to have a product that only interests uh, the two of us. But I think that's a trade-off uh, that is well worthwhile and, and, and one of the big uh, reform agenda points of the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, is to bring in much more standardization into the derivatives market. And I think that will increase transparency in a very important way. Well. Philip, you've taken on a very difficult subject. I must say, the question you raised, can banks regain public trust? But I must say, you addressed it in a way that I think has made it accessible to many of us who are not, as you know, professionals uh, in the banking field. You really have given us a much better understanding. The next step, by the way, I'm going to recommend to you is write a book on the subject. Okay. <laughs> and I grant to you, it will be a bestseller because everybody is trying to find out the answers <laughs> to this question. So can you all please join me now in thanking Thank Philip you very for much. an excellent lecture.